just on board. And when it comes to travel, uh, you know, I like to think I can tell a good story. Uh, he's been telling great stories for years. In fact, he's been our tour guide through American history, when it's, whether it's baseball or jazz or World War II or the Civil War uh, and, uh, and, of course, most recently, Prohibition, uh, which I want to get into a little bit later because there was so much I thought I knew that I didn't know and so much that I, that I thought happened over a period of one or two years that actually happened over a period of many years. Uh, his name, Ken Burns. Hello, Ken. Good morning. Yeah, listen, I have to tell you, uh, you know, the other day I was at Yankee Stadium and we got rained out, uh, and, and that was okay because I think the Yankees got rained out. Isn't it interesting, because I know you're such a baseball nut, that the highest payroll in, in American baseball just chokes? The three highest payrolls just dropped out of the, the running. The Red Sox, the, the Yankees, and the Phillies are all gone. And that and says to you? <laughs> it says that uh, there must be something in the air, a money ball is in the air, and that though it's been sort of poo-pooed recently, the advent of the new movie uh, with Brad Pitt about Billy Bean and the idea that you could use a, a different metric, statistical uh, metric, rather than just throw money at a problem, that, that maybe there isn't an IMT. I mean, I'm very much like you. I know I, know I can say this to you, that... I like going to baseball games. I like the travel to the game. I like—I yep. mean, the whole idea of going to a different city and just seeing how they do it, whether it's Fenway or Wrigley, you know, the, 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 the iconic parks, you know. But you did two documentaries, really. You did mm -hmm. baseball, then you did the most recent one, yep. right? Which I really found fascinating because really, that really talked about the money, didn't it? Well, it did. You know, we, we had, in 1994, we came out with an 18-and-a-half-hour, nine-episode, nine-inning history that took us up to 1992. Oh, extra inning. <laughs> and, and then we came to the last 20 years, and it was so radically different with strikes, with steroids, with a whole different thing, with Moneyball, that we had to come back and, and revisit it. And that's what the 10th inning was all about last year. And yet, because that, that particular special that you did, that documentary, to me, it was a little more, the first one was, was romantic, it was Americana, it was the history of America told through baseball. The second one you did was really like more of a wake-up call, like what's happened? Right, I think that you know we were in the midst of the steroid era. It was really important to try to figure out what that meant. Uh, is, there still, is there still purity in the game? Oh yeah, absolutely. This, the, what we're seeing between the lines right now is as good as it's ever, it's ever been. And you can now say that the steroid era is behind us. Uh, that it, we're looking at it in our rear view mirror and we can, you know, be disappointed that for a while we inflated some home run things, we extended the lives of, of pitchers, but nobody hit 401. I mean, hit a Ted White, the, the Ted White, the Ted White. Who, who did 70 years ago. Uh, nobody had a 56 game hitting streak as Joe DiMaggio did also 70 years ago. Nobody's had 125 or or 30 or 35 or 40 games, which would have been the statistical equivalent in pitching as hitting 73 home runs in a single season. Uh, so a lot of the worry, I, I put the steroid scandal number three in the list of scandals. The White, so the White Sox scandal? I would consider the worst scandal was keeping African Americans out of the game for so many days. Yes. Uh, as we discovered in the years after Jackie Robinson, when African Americans were let in on a quota system, they won the MVP in the National League uh, nine out of 11 years. That tells you what the game is missing. Wow. Uh, the second scandal is, is the drinking gambling scandal, which is epitomized uh, by the Black Sox scandal of 1990. Sox. But that was not the only thing. Their games were being thrown for decades, and nobody did anything about it, and, and gambling was a huge part of the game. Wow. And people, people like to be distracted by the Black Sox, just as in Prohibition, they like to be distracted by Al Capone, and then you forget about all the other stuff that was going on. Before we get to Prohibition, just one of the last baseball questions. Have you ever sat in the red seat at Fenway? I have, not during a game, but I, <laughs> I've, I've taken that tour many times. I've filmed that tour many times of the hapless New York fan hit by a Ted Williams home run and then changed his allegiance. And so... Um, this is a part of the great mythology that attends those uh, cathedrals of our secular religion. My only baseball piece of memorabilia that I have is an autographed picture signed by both Mookie Wilson and Bill Buckner. Ouch. Yeah. I was at a party once. Bob Costas took me to a sports party, which I never go to, and there was a very sharp-looking dress guy. And I said, geez, that guy looks so familiar. Who is it? He said, that's Mookie Wilson, and I'm a Red Sox fan, and I'm just, I'm going, oh my goodness. So after a while circling him, I finally came up, and, and I looked at him, and I was trying to think of what to say, and I said, my therapist says I should talk to you. And he looks at me without hesitation, he goes, Red Sox fan, right? I go, yeah. 
Well, the best one was that just as luck would have it, after the 86 World Series, the preseason, the first exhibition game of the next season at Chase Stadium was the Mets and the Red Sox. And when Butner got the bat, he got, he got a standing ovation. He got a standing ovation, <laughs> exactly, yeah. You know, he finally moved away from New England for yeah. a while because he couldn't, he, couldn't pump, do it. he couldn't pump gas at the local plane without somebody yelling Hell and screaming yeah. at him. Yeah. But 2004 and 2007 sort of cured all of that for Red Sox fans. We don't have the same Yankee insistence on winning have to win every single time that you're a failure if you you know <laughs> if you don't win a world championship uh, there there's lots of hand wringing in Boston for their collapse but it, you know nobody can actually take it seriously after 2004 and 2007 and the good news is the night they lost that Wednesday night uh, was one of the greatest nights in the history of the game in which there were four games being played eight teams involved when the quote Division leaders had more or less been settled. This was all for wild, wild card, our home field advantage. And everybody was watching and switching back from game to game. And they it were. really mattered. The Yankees collapsed and, and the Rays won in extra innings. And the Red Sox fell apart and won, and lost just a few minutes before. And I know. It was just in the National League with the with Atlanta and the Cardinals just as interesting. And, and of course, it, was, it determined whether the Milwaukee, who's got the best home record, right. was going to have an home field advantage. It was just one of those amazing nights in baseball. Let's shift gears because here we are in New Orleans. Yeah. I heard you speak last night so eloquently about New Orleans and music and jazz. And that's really something that you've been intimately involved in for a number of years. Yeah, I've, I've been drawn to this music and tried to understand it. And to try to understand the music, you have to know something about this city. This is the most original, unique of all America cities and it's so interesting that the uniqueness has to do with the fact that it is such an amalgamation of different influences and cultures the French the Spanish uh, the Caribbean uh, the African-American the the slave the free black the Creole the white all of these forces coming together and it's all of those forces with all of their histories with all of their cultures with all of their likes and dislikes that sort of coalesce in the 19th century and create what we call jazz the only art form that we Americans have created. And you know, it's one thing for you to do a documentary. And by the way, the word documentary, can we get a, get, let's deal with this for a second. It's what yeah. people say to me, name your 10 <laughs> best movies ever. Nobody, nobody puts documentary in there. No. And yet I define one of my 10 best movies as a movie that I would see over and over again. Right. And I put many of yours in that category. Well, thank you. I know, but seriously, I mean, and, and so here we are talking about jazz, and something that Americans don't know that much about. They don't. It, it, you know, there was a time in the late 30s, early 40s, when jazz music was 75% of popular music in the United States, of sales. It was swing, big band swing. It had everybody's attention. And uh, jazz went in a different direction, as so many different things did. Art went in a different direction. Politics went in a different direction, and things are different. But uh, we've lost that connection to this art form, which is Ameri it's the expression of America at its best. It's improvisation, which is our genius, whether it's business or, or, or wherever. Politically, the Constitution is just four pieces of paper, but we seem to be riffing and improvising on that pretty well. And nobody's ever described jazz as rigid. Not at all. This is the idea is that you listen to me, and you hear me, you recognize me. I listen to you, I hear you, I recognize you. And we play back and forth. It's got its roots in the old Baptist church of the call and response between the preacher and the congregation and the preacher and the choir. It's got slave memories and rhythms. It's got Scotch-Irish ballads. It's got all sorts of stuff, everything that was swirling around here. But it's utterly American. And it takes a look at the reality of things and doesn't try to sentimentalize it or make it turn it into nostalgia. It doesn't lie about it. It just says this is, and that's an amazingly powerful thing, which art always does. The best art does that, and what jazz does is do it in the moment. So you can be there and really have your whole life changed by a, an experience that you weren't expecting. And what you've done, which I think is phenomenal, and nobody else has done it, is you've taken this whole history that you've done on film, and you now have transformed it into a journey. That's right. Uh, with, with the folks at town. When we come back, I want to talk about how you take that from a documentary experience and put it as a hands-on experience for people who want to actually go experience it themselves. We'll be back with more from New Orleans with Ken Burns and a guy named Peter Greenberg. Actually, it's the Ken Burns Show. We'll be back with more right after this.